everyone, I'm Lisa Lepke from Pro Writing Aid and welcome to another session in the Pro Writing Aid series for writers. Believe it or not, this is our 59th session since we started last March. And initially we just wanted to run a few sessions to help people stay busy and inspired during the few short weeks of lockdown that we anticipated. And then I thought we would all get back to life as usual. And yet here we are. Um, where lots of people are still in lockdown and actually we've all fallen totally in love with doing these sessions. So we're just going to keep doing them until, until all of you stop showing up. Um, and today we have Jenny Nash back with us again. You may remember that she did a totally amazing session last September called five questions to ask before, to ask yourself before you write a novel. I'll drop a link to it in case anybody wants to bookmark it and, and watch it again later. Uh, but Jenny is the founder and CEO of Author Accelerator, which is a company on a mission to raise the bar on book, book coaching. So they train up book coaches and have trained more than 50. And their idea is that they'll support writers through the entire creative process. Um, and Jenny's own coaching clients have landed top New York agents and six figure book deals. And she's also the author of nine books. Um, so she's got her own knowledge that, that that's feeding into everything that she's going to share with us today. Um, and when I spoke to her, are you there? I'll come back on. Um, when I spoke to Jenny about doing another session for us, she told me that writing book proposals is her superpower. And, and that's a quote there. So obviously that was too good for me to say no to. So Jenny, how, has it always been your superpower? <laughs> um, no, it has, it has become that. And it, I, just, I just love helping writers do their book proposals. It's, it's great fun. And you'll probably hear why as I go through the slides. Okay. I think there, it's a real skill. It's a real art um, to put it together. So I'm looking forward to learning it. And oh, and look at this. Carla says, Jenny Nash is awesome. Uh, someone else says, I'm super excited to hear about book proposals. So that's great. So everybody's keen. Let's go. Shall I just get out of the way and hand over to you and you can hit the ground? Well, I wouldn't put it like that, but I will share my screen and get started on the slides so we can get to it. And um, I will answer questions at the end, of course. So please put them, put them in the chat and we will get- No, started. put them in the Q&A. Don't put them in oh, the chat. Don't put them in the chat. <laughs> chat in the chat. <laughs> questions got rules here, Jenny. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> All right, so um, the eight elements of a killer book proposal. That's what we are doing today. And thank you for the introduction. I am the founder and CEO of Author Accelerator, and we are on a mission to train book coaches. That's, that's what we do. And book coaches help writers through the entire creative process while they're writing. We help bring writers' dreams to life. These are some of the books from some of my clients that have recently come out. And it is just, uh, excuse me, so much fun to help people um, bring their vision to life. I am the author of nine books, as, as was just mentioned, in three different genres. And I literally wrote the book on book coaching, how, how to um, read books all day and get paid for it. So that is who I am and why I work on both fiction and nonfiction, if you're wondering about that. Um, that is because I, I believe that there are systems and processes that underlie the creative process that we can use to help any writer bring their book to life. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to talk about what a book proposal is and who needs one. And then I'm going to talk about the point of a book proposal. And then I'm going to go through those eight elements of a killer good proposal. And I will answer your questions at the end. So what's a book proposal and who needs one? So a book proposal is a tool that nonfiction writers use to attract literary agents who can help them land a traditional book publishing deal. That may seem like a simple definition, but I want to break it down because there's a lot hidden in this that might be confusing to people. So first of all, what do I mean by nonfiction? So that may be, seem very simple, but it's, but it's not. So nonfiction um, these are some examples that I just pulled of the kinds of books that, that you might um, think when you think of nonfiction. So we've got here a, a book that helps somebody learn something about college admissions, a cookbook, something about making money, a productivity book. Um, we've got uh, history, which is the, she said, um, something on a craft. 
Um, then there's books. This is where it can kind of get confusing. Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, has quite a lot of memoir in it. He's writing about his own life. So does Jen Sincero's book, uh, You Are a Badass at Making Money, quite a lot about her own life in there. Um, Jay Shetty's book, same thing. These, these are books that are uh, classified as nonfiction, but they also happen to be stories. And so nonfiction is really anything that is true, including memoir. So these books could be classified, those three that I just mentioned, as, as memoir. Um, and memoir falls under nonfiction. It is true. And the reason that nonfiction needs a book proposal, but fiction does not, is because Fiction depends entirely on the story, entirely how that story unfolds on the page. Whereas nonfiction depends very much on who the author is, what their platform is, and what kind of reader they're trying to reach very specifically. And that's why a book proposal is needed on the nonfiction side, but not on the, on the fiction side. It, it can be confusing. And there is a fuzzy line in the middle where memoir falls. And I don't have time to get deep into the differentiation today on what book needs a proposal or not if you're looking at memoir, but the shorthand would be this. All of my clients writing memoir do nonfiction book proposals. I think it is an excellent way to stand out and to make your case. If you want a little bit more on memoir, um, at this URL, I put some information. It's jennynash.com backslash book proposal info. And there's an article on there about this specific topic if you're writing memoir that will answer that question because I didn't want to take a lot of our time on it today. But nonfiction books are, are ones that are, are true in some way, shape, or form. And what is a traditional publisher? That's another question in that simple definition that we really need to get at. So a traditional publisher is one who pays the author upfront to acquire the book and employs a team to edit, produce, and distribute it. Now, if you're wondering where, what about hybrid publishers? What about self-publishing? Do I need a proposal for that? And the answer is no. And the best way to understand this, I think, is grab this key book publishing path document from Jane Friedman you can grab it at her URL, which is there on the screen. I've also got it on that page. I just shared on my site. And um, she puts this out every year and she happened to, to just put it out uh, a couple of weeks ago. And she lays out the, the universe of publishing on this one page in a way that is just really easy to understand. And what we can see here is that there are, um, sorry, um, two columns on here that are traditional publishing. And those are the two columns where you would need a nonfiction book proposal. These other places, you would not need them in order to publish through those paths. So nonfiction writers who are seeking to publish with a traditional publisher, those are the people that need nonfiction book proposals. So again, this is a topic that we could spend all day on about what's the difference between all these paths and you know, who, which way should you go and all of that. But just suffice this to say, if, if you want a traditional publishing deal, you're going to need a, a book proposal and you're going to go through an agent with that proposal to get to the publisher. That's what agents do. And they typically, almost always, in fact, you sell the book on the proposal. So you sell the book before you write it. You write the proposal before you write the book and you sell it on the proposal. And we're going to talk about that more as we go. But I just wanted to give you this brief overview of who needs a book proposal and, and why they need it. Um, and again, these, this, um, you can grab this map either at Jane's site or at, at mine. So if you are writing a nonfiction book and you want a traditional publishing deal, you are going to need a book proposal. And you're going to use that proposal to go out to the agent who will represent that book um, to the publishers for you. So what is the point of a proposal? And there, there are many points to it, but the main thing is to convince the agent and the publisher to invest in you and your project. So all of these parts of this statement are really important. It is a document meant to convince. It is a sales tool. 
And you are convincing first the agent, you're convincing them to represent you, and then the agent is using the proposal to convince the publisher to invest in you and your project. And when I say you and your project, that's a really important distinction. And that's another reason why you need a proposal for nonfiction, but not for fiction. Because when a novel is finished and whole and ready and done, in some ways it doesn't matter who that author is. They're not out there talking about the project in the same way that a nonfiction writer is. If you think of somebody like Suzanne Collins who wrote The Hunger Games, she famously gave very few interviews. I think maybe something like five interviews in her whole life. She is not out there meeting her readers and you know, doing Twitter and Instagram and um, she just doesn't do that. That is not her thing. And The Hunger Games has done just fine without her. So in some ways, the, non, the burden on the writer on the nonfiction side is to convince that both you and your project are worthy of investing in. And so that has to do, as we'll see, with how you connect to your ideal reader, how you interact with them, what you're doing in the world that, that um, aligns with them. And, and we will talk about that as we go. But it is a document meant to convince. So a book proposal is an argument for your idea, for why, what it is and why it needs to be in the world. It's a business case for your project. So that is to say, who is the audience? Why do they need this book? What else is out there that they're looking at? What's the competitive process that they're going through when they choose your book over another? What is that business case for the book? It's going to be proof of your ability to reach readers. You need to show how you're going to reach your readers, how you're going to interact and connect with them, why you're the best person to do this. It's going to sh uh, showcase your expertise. And your expertise can come from a wide variety of places. It could be that you're a scholar with a topic that you've been studying your whole life. It could be that you are someone who has deep experience with a certain topic or idea. Maybe you're an entrepreneur, maybe you're a teacher or coach. Maybe there's something that you know because you have done the thing. Your expertise could be that um, you were the first person to um, achieve something and, and have an experience that other people want to hear about or somebody who lived something that would be a memoir that other people want to know about. And a book proposal is also going to be a declaration of your voice, of what you sound like on the page, what you sound like when you talk about this idea. So the, the convincing part is really important for what a book proposal is all about. So let's go through the eight elements that make a really killer book proposal so that you can know what goes into them and, and how to create a great one. So remember, the whole point is you're going to send this proposal to the agent so that the agent signs you before you write the book. Now, when people hear that, they think this is a great deal. <laughs> um, I don't have to write the book and I'm going to get paid to, to, to write it in advance. And it is a great deal. But doing the work of a book proposal is basically taking all the very difficult work of writing a book and concentrating it into one document. You don't get out of doing the hard work. You just front load it into the book proposal. So writing a good book proposal is hard. It is, you have to envision everything about the book as you will see. All right, so the first of the eight elements of a book proposal is the overview. So the overview is short, it's a powerful summary of the whole book and your audience for this is the agent. You're writing directly to the agent and ultimately the publisher. So what you're doing is you're summarizing, what is this idea? Why does it matter? Why does it matter now? Who cares about this idea? Who might need it? Who your reader is? How is the book structured? What, it, what is the reader going to encounter in this book? What are the elements of it? And you want to do this in a compelling way that showcases the tone of, of your voice and the voice of this book. So most overviews are in the neighborhood of three to five pages. Um, sometimes they're a little shorter, sometimes they're longer, but the, the point of the overview is to just get everything into one small piece and 
place and package so that the, the agent can just quickly read it and get a sense of what you're trying to do here. So this is all of those things I just talked about, the convincing, the selling, the showing who you are and why it matters all goes into this overview so that they, they can grab it and, and know what you're trying to do. So when the agent reads the overview, what you want them to do is say, wow, this sounds amazing. This sounds awesome. This sounds great. And, and if they don't say that, they're not going to read any further in the proposal. So the overview is the gateway to the whole rest of the proposal. It's got to be great. And it's, and it's probably, I don't know, do I actually believe this? I was going to say the part of the proposal that, that you will work on the most. Um, I guess that is true. Um, we tend to go round and around and around and around on this as the idea is refined, as we really understand what the point is, as we really get it together, what this is going to be. And you just want to have this pitch perfect, the, the overview. So once the agent thinks that this whole idea sounds pretty awesome, the second thing in the proposal, the second element is the manuscript specifications. And this is a tiny little, oftentimes just two lines of the proposal that tells the agent and publisher how long it's going to take you to finish this book and how long this book is going to be. So you give a projected page count for the finished manuscript and that's based on your sample chapters, which we'll get to at the end of the eight steps. So let's say your sample chapter um, is 10 pages long and you are projecting that you're going to write 10 chapters. Well, now you know how long your manuscript is going to be. That would be quite short. <laughs> that would be a hundred page manuscript. So um, but, but maybe your book is short. So you would, you would put that on, on that line and then you would say, so right now we're talking in, in January, you might say, I expect to finish this book in uh, by September 1st of this year. So you're giving some indication of how long it's going to take you to write that book. Some people need to project a longer time than others because let's say you're doing quite a lot of research. Let's say you're doing quite a lot of um, interviewing. Let's say you're going to be tracking something over a long period of time. You might take longer to complete the book than somebody who um, just needs to finish writing it. Um, I just literally yesterday um, finished working with a writer who sold her book um, two months ago and she promised the in her proposal that she could get the book done in uh, two months time and they took her up on it and they said we want this book uh, two months from the moment we bought it and she needed to finish it and she wrote um, about 264 pages in those two months. That was pretty heroic. Um, she literally did nothing else. She cleared the decks for her entire life. She hired me, a book coach, to keep her accountable, to keep her on track, to keep her revising as she went to, to make sure that manuscript she turned in was the best possible thing it could be. That is not normal. <laughs> um, that was a pretty heroic undertaking, but um, she knew she could do it and she, her book was extremely timely. So she wanted to promise that and the publishers took her up on that. So this manuscript specification section is, is may seem like it's a short throwaway, but it's not. You're, you're telling them some important information here. So when they're finished with that section, they should say, okay, I can imagine the launch of this book. I can imagine when it's going to come out. I can imagine what um, that book, you know, how big it's going to be, what its shape is going to be, they can start getting a picture of what that book is going to look like. The third section of a book proposal is the author bio. So the author bio is not just your resume or a recitation of your awards. It is an argument for why you are the best person to write this book. Why should you write this book and nobody else? What, what do you know that nobody else knows? Why do you have something that nobody else has? And, and don't be thinking there, sitting there thinking, well, I don't, and that's why I shouldn't. Everybody has some reason why they're the best person to write their book. You just need to really drill down into it and, and hone it. And the author bio needs to give agents and publishers a sense of where you are in the world in relation to this idea and in relation to your audience so they can continue to envision 
how you're going to connect with those readers. So the author bio is a really powerful part of the book proposal that a lot of people skip over and they sort of just take their bio off of their website or you know, some sort of professional bio and slap it in here and think that that's it. And, and it's not. You really, this is really where you're really beginning to think through, how am I going to be in the world with this book? And you might really be thinking, um, this is my friend on the right, Mary Laura Philpot, whose book, I Miss You When I Blink, um, came out a couple of years ago. Um, so Mary Laura is a indie bookstore, total insider. She worked for um, with Ann Patchett at Parnassus Books in Nashville. She did a show for a long time on um, indie bookstores. She's, she's just an indie bookstore lover and an insider. And so her bio was going to bring that out and uh, showcase her as somebody that knows this world, that gets this world, that can be in this world, that can leverage this world. Um, you're not selling that yet in the author bio. You're just positioning yourself as that sort of person. So Mary Laura would have positioned herself in that way in what she chose to share in her bio. The other thing that bio includes is a photo, which again is not just a throwaway. Um, I've got two photos here from two extremely different kinds of writers, both kind of with the same name, which I thought was hilarious. Um, so on the left is um, Daniel Pink, who is a business writer. He writes books about selling. He writes books called Drive. He's got uh, you know, big bestsellers um, that are that are very businessy. So we kind of want to see him in a suit doing the business thing and a button down shirt. That makes total sense. Danielle Laporte, on the other hand, on the right is um, an author of a book called The Desire Map. And she helps mostly women find what they love and find what they want to do and be connected to. So her, her um, headshot is, well, it's not a headshot. Her <laughs> photo is, it's kind of moody and kind of um, artsy and kind of casual and gives the vibe of what she's writing about. So you really want to think through in your picture even what is your brand as an author? What are you selling? What do you want people to think or know or feel about you? And that too shouldn't just be a throwaway. At the end of the author bio, you want the agent to be thinking, wow, I can really see that this person is the right person to write this book. It's really making sense to me. It's really holding together. The fourth element of a killer book proposal is the audience analysis. And this is a robust section where we really dig in to give evidence that there's a wide readership for this book. Traditional publishers, which are the only ones that agents are, are, are selling to, um, they're looking for books that appeal to a wide audience. That is what they're looking for. They want books, like if you think about um, every Barnes and Noble in the country, every Target book book section in the country, the Costco bookshelf, you know, shelf, the um, airport, like what sort of books are going to appear in those places? They're going to appeal to a very wide range of readers in across a wide geographical and demographic space. And traditional publishers are looking to bring books out that, that appeal to that kind of a large audience. And so you need to give evidence that that readership exists. So I'm talking here about statistics. I'm talking about breaking it down in a way so that you, you can make your case that this readership is out there. Um, some, uh, an example, for, for example, <laughs> an example, for example, um, I'm trying to think of a, a good example. So I recently worked with an Instagram influencer who, um, whose audience is divorced moms. So women who have children who are divorced and her, um, her theme that she helps them around is moving on after divorce, finding your, finding your own sense of self again, finding your way again. And when I was working with her on her proposal, the challenge that we had and the thing that we were really circling around was, okay, really how big an audience is this? Are there, are there that many people who want to buy books who are, are in this audience? And this writer was absolutely convinced that there, there were. So she gathered her evidence from her own Instagram account, which was very large, to other 
other places that she writes for that also had large audiences and showing the kinds of reach that her articles and posts were getting, showing kind of listenership her podcast was getting, really breaking the numbers down to prove to the publisher that there was a, a wide readership for this book. That was our, our work and our challenge and, and our goal. And every single book has, has this challenge. You've, you've got to prove who the readership is. So even if you're writing memoir, if you're writing a story, maybe it's a story about um, an experience that, that you had, you've got to be able to prove that other people will care about that experience, that other people are interested in that experience, that there, there is a readership for it. So you're going to be pulling in evidence from all over to make your case who this audience is. Oftentimes the audience analysis section includes a primary target audience and then um, sub audiences or secondary audiences. So let's say that you're writing a book about um, uh, some sort of parenting thing. Your primary audience would be parents, but your secondary audience might be school counselors or school principals. It might be uh, summer camp leaders. It might be uh, pediatricians. You want to take a primary audience and really drill down into that and then break out the secondary and, and even further audiences that, that you might speak to. And every single book there's never been a book that I've worked on that doesn't have multiple target audiences. And thinking about that audience segmentation and who they are and where they can be reached and why they care about this book and how they're going to use this book is critically important for, for convincing publishers that, that you have a book that is worth them getting behind. One of the... Um, reasons. So what I do as a book coach when I'm coaching somebody through a proposal is I'm always trying to think, why is this book going to get turned down? What is going to be the reason why this book gets no's and rejections? And then what can we do to mitigate that risk? That's what I'm always thinking. And the one of the things that most, the rejections that are most common are, well, this seems really interesting. You seem like a great writer. Um, you've done a really good job with this proposal, but we can't figure out how to sell it. So that's a very common thing. We can't figure out how to sell it. We can't quite see the readership for this book. We can't quite wrap our minds around it. And this is the section where you want to really address that and also marketing, which we'll get to below. But this, um, this is not just oh, there's a ton of people, or oh, um, you know, every soccer mom in the world will want to read this book, or oh, every, um, you know, VP level manager would want to read this book, or every um, aspiring chef would want to read this book. That doesn't do anything. You've got to really bring your evidence, bring your proof, segment down your audience, and let the agents know that you know this audience, first of all, you know how to reach it, you know what else they're doing and what they need and what, what they're out there looking for. It's a really important part of the proposal. So when the agents are finished with the audience analysis section, you want them to say, wow, there's a big market and this author knows how to reach it. That's the goal of that section. The fifth section in the proposal is the comp title section. So some people call this competitive titles or comparable titles. Um, there's different ways of, of thinking about it, but this section is where you're going to put your book into the context of the marketplace and define exactly where it's going to sit on the shelf. And this is much more nuanced than it might sound because sometimes we're pulling um, comp titles from different genres. Sometimes we might even reference uh, documentaries or movies um, podcasts, uh, different things, but we want in this section to really hone in on what other books is this reader reaching for. So all of those things I talked about, the, the, the movies or the podcasts and all that is going to go in the marketing section. But here we want to really just say what books are like it? What other books are people that are going to buy this book reading? And the way that I describe this when I'm um, coaching the book coaches is I, I refer to this as the books are having a conversation and they're sitting on the shelf. 
and think of it like one book is saying, I believe this. And the other book is saying, well, yes, and I believe this, or well, no, but I believe this other thing. And your book needs to ping off of all the books around it in a, in a logical way. So in other words, you might have a book that, let's say there's a book in your um, area that everybody reads. So, you know, um, I'm trying to think of an example. So that would be uh, in the grief uh, category, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book on the, the, the stages of grief. You can assume everybody knows about that book. A lot of people have read that book. Um, people reference that book. It is a known entity in, in that realm. So the conversation you wanna have is if you're writing a book on grief, well, my book takes, uh, takes off where that book left off or my book drills down into the fourth stage of grief in a very deep dive way or my book actually blows apart the entire theory that there's five stages. That's ridiculous. I don't believe it. It's not the lived experience. I have um, counseling people through grief and I have a different model that I propose to debunk it. So in some way you would be uh, referencing or pivoting around that very well-known uh, book in your, in your space. Um, so the comp title analysis is, um, is a really powerful way of figuring out the world your book is going to be born into and the place that it has in that. This is a picture of me <laughs> in a bookstore. This is actually at Parnassus in, in um, Nashville. Um, and, and I put this in here just to remind you that the, your book sits on a shelf. It sits on one shelf. It doesn't sit on a shelf here and a shelf there and a shelf in this other place. It, it lives in one place and you need to know what place that it lives and what else is living around it. And when you imagine somebody going into a bookstore, you need to imagine where are they going? What are they looking for? What else is there? What else are they going to buy along with it? One of the uh, beautiful things about books is that people who need a nonfiction book or want a nonfiction book in a certain topic, usually buy a lot of books in that topic. So there, there is room for all the books. And you know this probably from your own reading experience. If you want to learn something or you're going through something, whether it's, you know, I want to take a trip to Italy, um, you're going to go buy all the books on, on how to travel to Italy. Um, if you are suffering from, um, let's say you were just diagnosed with breast cancer, you're going to go to the bookstore and buy all the books. If you're a reader, that's what you're going to do. And so you need to understand why would they buy your book? And that's what this um, comp title section is about. You want the agents to finish this section and to say, this author really understands the publishing landscape for this book it allows them to start getting a sense of how many copies they think they're going to be able to sell, which is part of the business case for your book. The sixth element of a killer book proposal is the annotated table of contents. This is really the heart and soul of the book proposal because the TOC, it doesn't just, it's not just a list of chapters. It's not just a little, a little, bullet point list. It really defines your reader's entire transformation journey. So you really want to show the arc of change they will go through as they read your book, the experience they will have of being in your book, what they're going to know when they're done. And you have to give a really clear sense of that, that journey and, and of the elements that they're going to move through while they move through that arc of change. And you have to do it in a way that is both logical and compelling. So when I said that a book proposal concentrates the hard work of writing a book into one space, that's what I mean. You have to think through the entire book. You have to know where it begins, where it ends, exactly what's in it, how the reader progresses, what the boundaries of your idea are, what's in, what's out, how many interviews are you going to have? How many places are they going to stop and do a quiz or an exercise? What, what is the mix of your story and other people's stories? 
all of those questions have to be answered and it is hard to answer them without writing the whole book. So when people say, you know, oh, sweet, I get to write a book proposal, you know, throw a few things down on the page and get paid for it. That is not the way that it happens. Um, my friend, Jess Leahy, oh, I have a picture of her coming up actually later, um, who wrote The Gift of Failure, which is a mega best-selling book. Uh, recently, well, her second book is coming out shortly and she spent a year writing the book proposal for that book. Um, I did not have the privilege of helping her through it. I just know this from being her friend. And, and she spent a year doing it because she had, she felt like she had to really convince people, despite her best selling former book, that she could write about a new topic and that she had the authority to do so. And so she, she spent most of that year reading every single solitary thing on this subject that she possibly could. And then, and then did all the work on what was the shape and structure of that book going to be. Now, a year is pretty extreme. Um, my clients usually do not take a year. They usually take somewhere in the neighborhood of four to six months to write a book proposal, but that's four to six months of extremely intensive back and forth um, collaborative brainstorming work, getting the idea right, and then really spending time refining and polishing it. And most of the work is here in the TOC. The other, the other sections um, definitely need work, obviously, and we go back to them and we go back and forth to them. And that overview is tricky to really get right. But the bulk of the work you're doing is here in, in the TOC. And it is heavy lifting. It is a lot of work. And um, it's good work, but the, the beauty of it is when you have it, you have a really clear roadmap for what to write. And when you then go to write the book, that's like the writer that I mentioned earlier who, who wrote her entire book in two months. She knew exactly what every chapter was going to be, exactly what was in it. She had this very clear roadmap and she just followed that TOC that we had made in her proposal. And it was just like, boom, 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 boom. And that's why she was able to write it so fast. You don't have to write it so fast, but doing the heavy lifting now allows you to do it. So when the agent reads your TOC, they're gonna say, I get this book. I can see it. I see the whole thing. I can picture it. I, I, I picture it on the shelf. I picture who's gonna read it. I get it. I get what's in it and, and I love it. That's, that's really what, what they're gonna um, feel. The seventh element of a killer uh, book proposal is the marketing plan. So the marketing plan is your chance to show exactly how you're going to connect with that audience that you defined in the audience analysis section. And it is going to present a really fully fleshed out vision of how you're going to be in the world with your book. And by fully fleshed out, I mean are you going to have workshops and courses? Who are you going to do them for? How are you going to attract that audience? Are you going to have a speaking career that goes along with this? Is the book going to propel you into that universe? Or are you already in that universe and this book is going to be sold at those events? Are you going to um, do a radio? Are you going to do podcasts? Do you have a podcast your own self? Are you already reaching this audience? all the ways that you are going to live and breathe this, this marketing of this book. And a lot of people think that getting a traditional book deal means they don't have to do this work, that the, that the publisher will do it for them. And that is absolutely not true. It just is not true. The authors have to do their own marketing. They have to do their own work. They have to be their own champion. And they have to have a vision for how they're going to do it. So when I said before that my job as a book coach is to mitigate the risk of, of the particular project, when we get to the marketing plan, if somebody does not have a large built-in audience already, part of the mitigation of that risk is to say, okay, then what are you going to do? How are you going to show that you know how to reach these readers, that you know this audience inside and out, you know where they are, you know how to reach them, you know what you're going to do, you like what you're going to do. So, you know, you would never propose a speaking tour if you hate to speak. Um, you're going to talk about your network, you're going to talk and really specifically your network. Who do you know? How can you leverage them? Um, what are you going to do to get the word out about this book? 
So book proposals, um, my clients' book proposals tend to be around somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 75 pages. That is, uh, the, the differential there has to do with the sample chapter size, but um, it also can do with the marketing plan. Sometimes people have 10 or 12 page marketing plans, depending on what they do in the world, who they know, what they're going to, to um, do when the book comes out. Other people's are not going to be quite so long. And the, the feedback that uh, a really common rejection feedback is, we love this book. We love this writer for this book. We see the audience. We love the TOC. We get it. We see the whole thing. We can picture it. Um, but again, we're just not so sure how this writer is going to reach this audience. We're not sure that they're in the best position to do this. And, and that is heartbreaking. And it's one of the reasons why you hear people talk about platform all day long, that having a platform, having an audience you can speak to is so important to, to selling the book. But that is not to say if you don't have a platform that you can't sell a book because you can. It happens all the time. And it happens to my clients all the time that you find someone to take a risk on you. You find someone to take a bet on you. And they will do that if all the other elements of a proposal are in place showing your case and showing the proof and the evidence that you know what you're doing and that you know how to execute a marketing plan. So it doesn't have to be, um, you know, I have 200,000 people sitting there ready to buy my book who are my newsletter followers. It doesn't have to be that, but it has to be something and it has to be strategic and it has to be clear. So at the end, um, oh, here's Jess. Um, Jess Leahy speaking to um, some girls at a school. And um, I put this in here because Jess has a massively big, well, she did before 2020 happened, massively big speaking career in which she goes to schools and she does presentations to students, to parents and to teachers all in the same day. So she goes in and does a full day of training for the entire community. And um, they all buy the book, they all read it, and she gets paid a lot of money to do this. And that is part of her strategic plan. That is part of the way that she pitches it. And that is part of what she does to reach people. So she doesn't necessarily herself have, have you know, some vast social media following, but she has a very clear and strategic and effective plan for reaching her audience. And she reaches it. Her books are mega bestsellers because she knows exactly who her audience is and what to do when she gets there. And that's going to be what the marketing plan is. You want the agents to say, this author can get this book into the hands of her ideal readers. That's, that's the goal. The eighth and final part of a killer book proposal are the sample chapters. So this is where you're going to showcase what you mean when you promise above what you're going to do. So you really need your very best work here to prove to agents and editors that you can pull off what you promise in the proposal. And oftentimes I hear from agents that when they get to the sample chapters, they're holding their breath you know, please let this writer pull off what they say they can pull off because it sounds so good. And that, you know, the proof needs to be there. The, it, the evidence needs to be on the page that you can pull this off. And that's what these sample chapters are there to show. So which chapters you decide to write for your sample chapters is something I spend a lot of time with, with my writers trying to sort out and figure out. It's usually the first chapter and it's usually the second chapter unless there's something compelling happening later in the book that you really want to showcase. Maybe later in the book you get into more scientific analysis or maybe later in the book you get into interviews and if there's something like that you want to leap over the second chapter and showcase one of those chapters later in the book. But either way, these chapters have to be highly polished, pitch perfect, just excellent so that the agents get to that um, end of those chapters and say, wow, this author can pull off this amazing idea and I want to sign them. So the proposal tells a story. It, it tells a story that pulls the agent all the way through from well, I, uh, this is an interesting idea to, I hope they can um, give it justice to, um, wow, I really like the way they framed it. 
And wow, I really like this writer's voice and who they are in the world and how they're thinking about their reader. They really understand the reader. They understand this audience. They understand the publishing universe that this book will born, be born into. Um, they know how to market the work and they, um, they can write, they can write it, they can pull it off. And that's what gets you to yes. That's what gets you all the way there. And once you get that, the agents will then work with you to probably polish up that proposal even more and, and submit it out to publishers. So there are some handouts about all of these things, the Jane Friedman map. Um, I have a map on the, the way you move through a, a book proposal, depending on what you're writing, if it's memoir or not. Um, and I also have these eight elements um, on, on a download that you can get at a book uh, JennyNash.com backslash book proposal info. So if there's anything you're wondering um, that I talked about, they're all there. And um, if you are interested in working with a certified book coach or becoming one, you can visit authoraccelerator.com to check out that information. We would love to help you or to train you how to do book coaching. And that is the end of the slides. I know I was talking Great. so fast. <laughs> <laughs> because I was trying to get it all in, but um, there's a lot to cover. That's fair. So all uh, of those, all of those links are in the chat right now. Um, but if you're having trouble copying them out of there, um, we'll send them in a, in an email with a replay tomorrow. So if you want to go back and look at any of those eight sections, because I feel like we could probably do a section on each of the. We could do a full session on each of those eight sections. Maybe not on the could. <laughs> we could. <laughs> Yeah. But I, I am happy to stay as long as you'll have me, Lisa, and answer people's questions. <laughs> okay. There's some really nice comments. I just wanted to pull out one of the comments that that came up in the um, chat. Bruce I love says, it because we're chatting. That's awesome. I know. It's great. Um, so Ruth says, I love the idea of a new book joining a conversation with the books that are on the shelf already. It makes the point of finding the comp titles so clear. And I, I love that because I think people struggle with like, how do I, how do I write about a topic that people have already written about? But if you're joining yeah. a wider conversation. Yeah. And especially if there's a book that's sort of a, a juggernaut like that, I said the five stages of grief, but every, every category seems to have one, you know, like there's what to expect when you're expecting. If you're writing about pregnancy, there's um, you know, business books, there's always sort of the darling business book of the moment, but something like um, uh, How to Make Friends and Influence People, which has been published for years, people still reference that and refer to that. And I'm actually working with someone now that's doing a kind of, we need to update that for the social media age type of book. And so they're using it as a touchstone. So if you think of it as, as a conversation, that's the way that I think readers read books is you know, I learned this from this one and I learned this from the other and then I'm going to go to this one and I want to go yeah. deeper. So I'm going to go over here. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've had a couple of people, I asked you this before we started, a couple of people asking about whether or not you do book proposals for fiction. So the answer is no, um, you don't. And um, it just is just the way the publishing works. Nobody will pay you to write a novel in advance unless you're very famous. <laughs> <laughs> um, and if you're very famous, all you have to do is give this much of your next book and they'll say, great, here's a bunch of money, go write it. it. Yeah. Um, but the rest of us have to write the book first for fiction. And the reason is because it's totally about the story, how, how the story unfolds. Whereas you can see with a nonfiction book, it's really about the idea, the argument, the audience, it's those things you can talk about and that you have to talk about without actually writing the book. Um, and as I said before, the question of memoir gets very tricky because it sort of falls in the middle because memoir is actually sold like fiction. It's a story and it's sold like fiction. So what I have my clients do is they write their memoir and then they do a book proposal. And usually the book proposal is a little shorter um, for that situation, but it helps make your case, it helps prove your point. It really can be powerful to, to have that in your back pocket, even though it's a ton of work. The other thing that I really, that really resonated was the idea that your table of contents is the arc of your story. Yeah, like I know it's nonfiction, but what's the, 
what's the argument and the ideas and how are they going to build on each other and what's the arc of that and i just think that's a table of contents is it's the it's the skeleton of your of your book isn't it yes and now that you're saying that i just wrote a blog post with with if i make myself a note i will put up on that web page my my web page with the info for you guys um i'm writing a note here um i just did a post on um how to read table of contents just, like i'm a super nerd about tables of contents <laughs> and i love them and there's ones that are so beautiful in and of themselves that they tell the whole story just the table of contents and and i have a list of those is um is um my my point and you can go look at them and you can see oh i can see this whole book i can see exactly what this author is doing it, it's got a beautiful shape and structure and all i'm looking at is the table of contents and that's what i'm always striving for with my clients is write a table of contents that's so beautiful that that you can't not want the book <laughs> yeah well and even as a buyer of nonfiction books that that's the first place i go you know if i look at a shelf that's full of books on marketing I'll pull them down and look through the table of contents and just assess it based on that structure and that skeleton to see what's in there and what's not. And that's right. way right. more so than the back of the book, because I always feel like the back of the book is trying to sell me something a bit more, whereas I can go to the table of contents and actually see the, the bits and pieces. Right. And I do see somebody asking a question about, well, if if a similar book hasn't been written, doesn't that make your book unique? And um, agents and publishers don't actually want to hear that a book like yours has never been written. That is an argument they don't like. If you say nobody has ever written a book like mine, that's going to make them nervous. They want to know that there's books. <laughs> no one's like ever yours. bought a book like that either. Yeah, right. And so um, it's easy to be lulled into thinking nobody's ever done this. Really, really, nobody's ever done this. And and you you want to break that thinking because they want to. What they're going to do is look up the sales numbers for these books and start positioning how many copies they think your book could sell. So they want something to go off of, something super tangible to go off of. My book is like this one. And and sometimes you can cross genres when you're referencing comp titles, which is which is an interesting um, yeah. tactic too. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a few people that are asking questions about marketing generally and about building. I always feel like lots of writers are really scared of the idea of marketing and that they think they have to do all of the things. They have to go and do the talks like you're the, the author who you had oh, referenced. Just like, yeah. Or they have to have like a huge social following or they have to have this. And I always just, there'll be, I always tell authors that there'll be something out there that feels comfortable for them. Does that, does that feel right to you? A hundred percent. So when I'm working with the author on their marketing plan, it's like a Venn diagram of where does your reader reside out there? What are they doing? How can you reach them? What is your superpower? What do you love to do? If you love to um, talk, you you know you can go on podcasts. That's perfect. If if your if your audience is listening to podcasts, if you love to um, write blog posts or Instagram, and that's where your audience is great. You can do that. You don't have to do anything, but you've got to do something and you've got to figure out what do I love that crosses over where my audience is and how can I, how can I leverage what I know and, and figure it out. And, you know, you don't have to, um, you know, I don't like that notion that, oh, you will have to be on Twitter, or you have to do this or that, you, you know, you don't have to do anything. You just have to know how, how to reach your reader and where they are and, and, and prove that, that you know how to do that and that you like that and you can do that. And the more specifically you can do that, the better. And by that, I mean, in the marketing section, I have my, my writers literally design a keynote speech. If they say, I'm going to go to conferences and speak to um, salespeople, it's like, okay, what's the keynote? What's the breakout session you would give? What if you were invited to do a half-day workshop? What would you do? What if you were invited in-house to a corporation to give that workshop? What would it be? How would it change? What if you were invited to go to a college or would you not want to go to a college? You know, like really trying to figure out where 
does, where do you belong in the world based on what, what you want to do and be? And, you know, one of the things that's really somewhat sad about this topic is people will sometimes say, I don't want to do any of that. I just want to write and have somebody else do that. It doesn't work that way anymore. <laughs> and I don't know that it ever did work that way. Actually, I think there's a myth that it worked that way. But even back in the day, like Mark Twain and um, Ernest Hemingway were doing, you know, things that 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 were PR related or or marketing related because they had to. So, you know, it's it is kind of sad. And if you don't want to do any of that of that um, marketing work, you've got to really then think about what your goals are and um, you know what yeah how you're gonna move forward yeah i've just dropped a link there one of our books um in the providing aid library is all about building um an author platform on a shoestring it doesn't say the title there in the link but it's the one that ends in ebook six um so i've just dropped a link so you can get a free copy there and it's it's all about like all the little bits and pieces that you can do to build your platform because deborah was asking about how to build a platform and a few other people were and so it sort of just gives you a starting point and a few things that you can try and you can read through it and see what feels good to you um, so that you can start putting some of those pieces together. So when it comes to writing the proposal, you know, you've got more to put in that section. Sometimes yeah. it's a little bit like adding your hobbies to your CV, but it, it makes it, it just gives you that little boost and, and can make it resonate a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so in terms of just formatting, James wants to know, do you do you break it down into different sections, like in a resume? Is it just like a report? You do. Yes, you do. Um, just the sections that I went through, um, usually in the order that I went through them, that's that's often how they appear. And uh, with headings like that, and, and um, you might have a table of contents for your proposal with hyperlinks so that people can easily jump um, jump to the different sections. Um, that the thing that's really sad about it, um, James, is that you do all this work to put your proposal together, and then oftentimes when you start pitching, you break it apart, <laughs> um, and that's because uh, different agents ask for different things. Some will say, "Send me the overview in the TOC." Um, some will say, uh, "With their query letter." send me um, the overview. Some will say, send me the first 10 pages. Some will say, send me uh, the first chapter. You know, it's all kinds of different requirements. So we build it up and then we actually break it into parts and we deploy it. You have to do what the agents ask. So they all ask different things and you have to give them different things. There's also a lot of agents moving to um, forms online. So you have to break it apart and drop it into their form. And sometimes it's very confusing because what they ask for doesn't seem like it aligns with <laughs> what you have. And you're like, well, now what do I do? And so it, um, it, you, you do break, build it up to break it apart, but, but I, um, definitely the different sections. So good to have those pieces as a starting point. Um, if you've already got your novel, um, should you include it or sorry, not your novel, your manuscript, should you include it? Uh, no, they, they will not want it. Um, they, they have a very particular way that they're going to work through it, the proposal, but what, what you would do in your query letter and in your manuscript specifications is you would say, this book is complete. This manuscript is complete. So they might, once they get read through, once you go through the proper channel of giving them what they ask for, they may see that and say, oh, send me the whole thing. That would be great. Um, or, you know, at a certain point, if they're going to sign you and you have a full manuscript, they will ask for it. But um, it, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's um, not always a great idea to have the finished manuscript because sometimes they want to tweak it or change it or will say, would you be willing to do this or that or approach it in this different way? That's one of the beauties of a proposal is that it's um, massageable. <laughs> uh, you know, you can you can still change it. So um, there is a bit of a risk in completing in completing the manuscript um, and trying to sell it on a on a proposal. But like I said, I often recommend that with memoir, which is which is uh, memoir is its own special <laughs> category. Um, we're we're out of time, but. 
we can maybe squeeze in a couple more here. I see that there's still lots of people hanging out. Um, so if you if you are nonfiction, do you, and you don't have much of a backing, is, is it worth uh, um, attempting to self-publish first to build some of that credibility and try and sell your own? And then um, you've got that for a book proposal? Or would you try going straight in with a book proposal? Um, I'm not sure I understand. I'm trying to see the question um, so that I it? can answer it correctly. So if you're just if you're just starting out, do you yeah. would you recommend indie or self publishing? If you, if oh, you don't have any of that background, you don't have the profile. Um, so I would recommend doing some work around what your goals are for why you want to publish this book and that can really drive your decision making. For example, um, the book that I showcased in my slides on book coaching, I published that myself. That was a self-published, indie published, totally my own self because the market for book coaches is tiny. <laughs> and, and I happen to have my finger on the large majority of that audience. So it doesn't make any sense for me to go to a publisher to try to reach that audience when I know how to reach that audience best my own self. So that sort of book, you wouldn't, I wouldn't even bother. I didn't even, I mean, I have an agent. I didn't even tell her about it. Like it doesn't make any <laughs> sense, right? So um, it depends on what your goal, what your goal is. There are a lot of writers these days, more and more are publishing all over the place. Meaning I've got a book with a traditional publisher. I have a book I self-published. I have a book I've hybrid published. I tried this and now I'm doing that. Um, this book seems to work here and this one works this other place. And the way I like to think about it is publishing is just a tool. It is not the end game. And people think it's the end game. It's just a tool for getting your writer, I mean, your, hand, your, your writing into readers' hands. And that's the end goal is to impact your, your, your reader, to reach them, to, to move them, to change them. And publishing is just a tool to get you there. So try not to think about, oh, getting a traditional publishing deal is the goal. And, and then I'm you know done. That is so far from the truth. So it really depends on what is your book? What is your goal? Um, what resources do you have to, to bring it out and, and that are available to you? Sometimes I'll work with a, um, a client. I'm working with somebody right now, in fact, who um, ha is writing a book about uh, having a career in the uh, world of restaurants. So it's like a career book for food people. And she has been, she wrote a gorgeous, powerful, beautiful book proposal, I think. And she um, started pitching agents and it's not going well. And it's not going well because it's kind of a funny book. It's not a cookbook. So all the agents that are food oriented and, and love cookbooks are kind of like, it's kind of a business book. And so then, you know, we're going to maybe try um, business agents, which is one of the reasons why you pitch in batches, by the way. But um, while this is all going on, she's begun to think, I might just not go traditional because I'm not sure that they get me and what I'm trying to do. And I think I know exactly how to reach this audience. We worked so hard on our marketing plan. She can see it, she can taste it. She just wants to be out there doing it. So she's thinking, why would I wait? Because traditional publishing is very long, a very long uh, timeline. Why would I wait? Why would I give up con creative control and money when I think I know exactly what I would want to do and, and could just go do it. So sometimes somebody's goal changes in the middle of the, the process. Um, so by writing a book proposal, she actually came to understand her project in a, in a better way. Um, so, so I would just say, really get clear on your, your goals. And if you're confused, um, you know, shameless plug, I would say work with a book coach because they can help you understand your goals, understand your chances. Not that we have a crystal ball, but, um, we can, we can help you, um, decide which path might, might be best for you. Okay. I think that's probably a great place to end. Um, if you enjoyed this, um, say so in the chat so that Jenny knows that you did, and then we can get her to come back again and tell us.
Oh, there's lots of thank yous coming in. <laughs> and Michelle, yes, um, that article on the TOC, I'm going to put it up on that page at jennynash.com backslash book proposal info. I'll put it up there later today. Um, so you can you can grab that. Great. Um, and we'll send out a recording of this in case you want to go back again and all of those links in an email tomorrow. And thank you again, Jenny. That was, I feel like there's a lot of information in there and I really appreciate it. And I feel like everybody that's here is going to feel a bit more inspired and ready to go and write it. So thank you. Thank you for having me for writing. It is awesome. And um, I am a big fan and I appreciate your inviting me back. All right. Great. So we'll see everyone next time. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.